Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. This time out, two very special guests joining us. We have Ben Folds here and Elliot Shiner. Guys, thanks for coming in. Appreciate you being here. Oh, just we'll start both at once, right? We'll start with Elliot. Good to see you guys. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate you being here. I should have clarified earlier that you know what order we were going to shake hands in. Yeah, that's been, okay. That's better. important. <laughs> That'll be the only part people will watch. Yeah, right, right, right. Exactly. So you guys are here. You're going to be doing a uh, seminar workshop tonight here at uh, Sweetwater, and then a concert tomorrow night, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect. Um, well, I don't know what to expect uh, from, from. Well, I can know a little bit of what to expect with the orchestra because I play with them a lot. And uh, we'll play some of my songs and then um, a concerto that uh, I've composed. Mm -hmm. uh, with this, I, I, I don't know. I think we're going to have some fun. We're going to sit down in front of the audience. We'll talk about a variety of things. And I think you're going to play a little uh, piano, right, for yep. us and uh, do some songs and things and mm -hmm. talk about some of the things that L.A.'s been working on as well. So um, let's, uh, let's start by, Ben, you're from uh, North Carolina originally, mm -hmm. yeah. correct? So. Uh, you have a lot of interesting stories associated with your uh, with your career. As I was I was looking into things, uh, one that caught my eye was uh, throwing your drum kit into a lake out of desperation. What's the story behind that? Well, I'm learning more about. I'm piecing more of this past together recently. <laughs> I was just at University of Miami where this went down, and um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the semester, well, it's a really long story, but I had a full scholarship. Uh, which was a rare thing to have. And it was really good because I wasn't doing that well in high school. So uh, this was uh, this kind of allowed me to keep moving forward and do something I wanted to do. I was having a really good grade point average to keep my scholarship. Everything was good, but the night before juries, which is you know your finals mm -hmm. for your performance major, which I was, uh, I got in this sort of silliness that resembled a fight with one person beating the other person up. And um, I ended up with a broken hand and stitches and all night in the hospital. Got out of the hospital in the morning, didn't do very well on my test. I thought I flunked it, but apparently um, now I'm in touch with the, the, the professor, teacher from like 30 something years ago now. Right. So we're talking and he went and looked up the grades and I got a C, C minus on it. So wow. it wasn't enough to be called flunk, you know, and he said, that's pretty good with a broken hand. Yeah, right. Uh, it's just that it wasn't enough to keep my scholarship. So um, I threw my drums in the lake. Nice, nice. So were you there that's, as a... As you do if you flunk. You right, know? right. Were you there as a percussionist or as a... As a percussionist, pianist? yeah. Okay. Yeah. So were you, you had gotten a piano when you were nine. Your dad brought one home, right? Yeah, he, uh, he's construction kind of carpenter and was working on a, um, refurbishing a house and uh, they gave him a piano. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there was a, a piano in the house. It came in, it must have been seven or eight o'clock at night before MASH came on that night. Right, right. And there you were. Yeah. And here you are. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't wait to play it. I thought I could play it. Well, in, the, in the morning I anticipated I would play all these songs. I was listening to the radio, mm -hmm. transistor radio, which had FM and AM. And I was listening to all this piano stuff, and it's like, yeah. I remember thinking, well, if nothing else, I can do that. Lou Rawls, you'll never find. Right. Ding, ding, do, do, do. I remember hearing that and going, I can do that. <laughs> right, right, right. So how did you end up in Nashville? I got a, uh, a publishing deal uh, when I was, uh, I guess, 21 or 22. I, um, I was playing in a funk band, playing bass in a funk band. And uh, we were supposed to open up for a guy who sounded like Prince. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a chemist, but all the all the um, record companies were flying in to see this guy because he had a really good voice and you know it sounded like Prince, so they were all coming in to see that. And he hired me to play bass with him. Between that arrangement, my band, who I didn't sing for, I just played bass. Uh, we disbanded, mm -hmm. and I just took it took the slot because no one else was going to be there playing the songs I was writing on the piano. That led to a publishing deal and a lot of record interest and I'd only played one show. Mm -hmm. I played a second show and it was, it was terrible. Right. It was <laughs> terrible. I was so nervous. I tried to put a band together. It was like some kind of lounge. You get. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's how I got to Nashville. So that was before Ben Folds 5. Yes. Which was a trio. Mm -hmm. A trio. Three, three people. Um, what was uh, Party Time, Five Songs for Jesus? That was the funk band. Okay. Yeah, there were Three songs. Three songs. <laughs> yeah, was so was our relationship with this three, five thing? Uh, you know, I guess I thought that was funny at the yeah. time. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that was uh, five songs by Jesus. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah so that was, uh, that was a band called Majasha, which 
we believed was some sort of Indian name for uh, for penis, but I, I don't think that it's true. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's true anymore. I'm trying to figure that out. Right, right, right. So, Elliot, you have. Uh, I'm done. 25 Grammy. <laughs> yeah, you're, that's right. How do you follow that? Right? 25 Grammy nominations. That's how you follow that. Seven, yeah, seven <laughs> Grammy wins, Emmy awards, Emmy nominations, tech awards, incredible career as an engineer producer. And you started with Phil Ramone. I did. How did that happen? Uh, my uncle, who's no longer with us, a guy named Chauncey Welsh, was a, a New York City studio musician, trombone player, used to be in uh, Benny Goodman Band and the Dorsey Brothers and and I expressed an interest to do this. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, let me, uh, let me introduce you to this guy, Phil Ramone. You know, he's like the king of New York. Right. And, and it was actually, I remember it was October 10th, and uh, I came up to meet with Phil. It was 10 o'clock in the morning, and 10 minutes later I had the job. I just said, wow. And it was, you know, it was tough in those years because you really did have to know somebody to get in there. Mm -hmm. There wasn't, you know, there weren't schools that taught anything, and you had to have somebody be committed to being your mentor. Right. So you basically learned your craft as his apprentice? Yes. What was the first session you worked on with him? Uh, the very first one was a movie. It was, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the movie. It was uh, The Love and Spoon, you're a big, you're a big, big boy now? Hmm. Love and Spoonful did the music for it. And, okay. Uh, I think it was Diana Ross was in it. Right. I right. think. Right. It's a long time ago. So since then, Steely Dan, Eric Clapton, the Eagles, who did uh, Hell Freezes Over, the history of the Eagles, uh, tons and tons of great projects and movies. Ben, ben Folds. Ben Folds. So what, what is the, the connection here? You two are, are touring together, basically? No, no, we're not touring together. I just, every now and then I come out on the road. Okay. I, the show is so unbelievable. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it truly is the most incredible show I've ever seen. Yeah. You know, it's just so different. It's so different than anything anybody's ever seen you know and the way he the way Ben gets out there and you know handles the orchestra and plays his stuff and mm -hmm. handles the audience and the in the interaction because I would have to say and I could be wrong about this but it seems like you know the majority of the audience are not the regular symphony goers yeah I don't think so they've no. gotten the tickets somehow from those regular goers <laughs> yeah know? so they're there for him and it was really apparent last night because when the show ended they wouldn't leave right Right. So it was it was amazing. So you're doing some of some of your songs, but then you've composed a piano concerto. Yeah. Is that something you've always kind of wanted to do, been in the classical side of things? I I, I take on things sort of uh, spontaneously when it comes to music. It it seems to work. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, I, you never know who you're going to work with, and and it's all kind of it's it's always some. It's like you meeting Phil. It's just kind of crazy luck. I think if you set your eyes on something, if I thought, well, I'm going to make a piano concerto when I was younger, I, I'm not sure that I would have known how to get there. But it just mm -hmm. happened. It was, it was a commission that was offered. And I thought, well, I'll, yeah, I'll try it. And right. it ended up taking a year. It was a, real, it was a real serious undertaking. And that's how we got together because um, you know, we, we wanted to record this thing. And so we're recording it. It's not an easy... I mean, I can't imagine working with anyone else doing that. I mean, there was like 10,000 mics in the room and stuff. It was insane session. Right, God, right. it was so great. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing. Right, right. So did you do uh, all the orchestration yourself? Did you have to study all of that? Or how did you, uh, how did you accomplish that? I had a that? guy I worked with for the orchestration. Mm -hmm. um, I put pretty much every note that's there. But I think orchestration is, uh, there's a lot to know. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I certainly had to have someone there to say, at least if nothing else, uh, your French horn player just passed out. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks for telling me that. Right. Or, you know, you've really used the oboe a lot, and it's not very special anymore in this section. You want to think about passing that off to someone else. So mm -hmm. it's like having a producer. Right. Uh, but I think that uh, these days it's so common for a rock artist to have an idea, <clears throat> scribble the idea out maybe or put it on a voice note and just leave it to an orchestrator to take care of. Mm -hmm. That I did not do. I, I, I put pretty much everything that's in there. That's, that's what I heard. And I, and I gave myself 15 seconds a day. Like basically I wanted to hear 15 seconds of composed orchestration mm -hmm. completed per day. And then, you know, after a couple months I might tear two minutes of that down and just throw it absolutely away. Right. It was, you know, I can't, 
In a way, the tools that we had, I think, you know, years ago uh, before computers were probably superior in some ways for, um, for the imagination. Uh, but I think the tools that we have now, if you don't let them uh, control um, the composition and you remain, you know, uh, dedicated to your imagination mm -hmm. before all else, then the computer doesn't lead the way. And that, that was a struggle I had. A lot of what I threw away was because I began composing for the gestures that were in the samples. And I think that, that it still needs to be viewed as this is a mock-up and a tool. Right. It's an amazing tool. Mm -hmm. it, it made it possible for me to do it. I learned so much. But every night I'm, I'm orchestrating for the orchestra anyway. I, I call out parts and we, you know, we put songs together. And, and that way I can hear, oh, that's what happens when I double this with a flute in this range. It doesn't work. You know? So right. I'm getting a crash course that way too. Sure, still. sure. In 15 seconds of full orchestration, that doesn't sound like much, 15 seconds, it's but a that's lot. a lot of music to, uh, it's a lot. to get laid out. You yeah. know, and some days the 15 seconds would be two seconds, and the next, <laughs> the next day it would be 30 because it depends on how maybe all you need. You know, obviously the cadenza, well, that's easy. You know, it's just piano. <laughs> right. I and mean, there are times that you don't have to use the whole orchestra. It's like 2D is, that's a big deal. When mm -hmm. you go 2D with an orchestra, that's not something you just drop on everybody all the time. This is a real sectional sort of thing it's an amazing palette to work with um, right right yeah a lot of colors available lots of dynamics and, and you can do a lot of shaping with yeah just how you lay things out. and 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 every register has another version of that palette so yeah you can double someone within a half an octave range is going to have a particular timbre that changes as you go up and down and depending on what else is going on when you get there <laughs> stuff doesn't sound like what you think it's going to sound like and i think it's real important to work the real thing yeah. right Right. Do you anticipate that this will shift your perspective when you're writing things for smaller ensembles, for rock groups, for those kinds of things? No, I don't think so. I mean, it might. I mean, mm -hmm. I, th I think I've always thought about the band as, as being an orchestration. That's mm -hmm. not unusual, but I think that I know how to place those things with a piano, bass, drum, guitar, something like that. That's pretty obvious. But like right now, we're working with this group, Why Music? Mm -hmm. And uh, they're amazing. They're they're a, like a classical sextet, and they don't have normal stuff like bass. They don't have stuff that it's. They're all right there, you know. Like and so, we've been working on how to open that up and make that work. And I like the, I like the um, the mystery of it. Yeah. Right. Right. So Elliot, when you when you're going to record something like this. You've worked with, obviously, orchestras in a variety of different situations, film score situations, pop artists and things. When you're working more with a traditional orchestra recording with an artist in front, do you approach that differently as a producer and as an engineer? No. So the same no, way? I mean, you have to approach it the same way. Mm -hmm. You're still dealing, and this, this, for the concerto, it was the largest group I've ever recorded at mm -hmm. once. There were 82, 80, yeah. 82 players mm -hmm. in, in RCA Studio A, or wow. it's now called... Grand, Grand Victor, Victor. Grand Victor A. Yeah, right. I mean, it was amazing. And you know what? It, it, had the room been totally empty, it would have been really comfortable. Mm, yeah. You know? But, you know, there, there's a lot of pianos in there, and they got moved on their side. But even so, I mean, there were some tight spots, but I thought it, I thought it sounded pretty good when we were done. Mm-hmm. Is your approach to try to capture the image with a, a like a main pair of stereo mics, or do you use more close miking and spot mics? Well, no, there's not really close mics in any in any sense. Mm -hmm. You know, everything has got some distance, uh, but I didn't rely on a decatry, if that's what you're alluding right. to. Yeah, for me, the orchestra was a little little too big. Didn't have the microphones I would have used for a decatry. Mm -hmm. um, so I was more reliant on. Uh, on on the mics over the individual instruments and it wasn't it was sectional you know it was right. uh, there were you know to cover all the, the a violins it was just two mics mm -hmm. and the same thing for the b's and okay. it was generally everything got mic via section like that okay and what about the piano how did you approach uh, micing that um well ben has these two mics that he loves on the piano and we ended up using them mm -hmm. and it, it sounded pretty great rejection was r really good uh, yeah, because SM57s are just awesome with their <laughs> <rejection>. <laughs> Sure, yeah, sure. 
<laughs> yeah, and it worked out really good. Yeah. I'm still thinking about that Indian word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Majasha. Majasha. <laughs> yeah. Scratch your head about that one for a while, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, speaking of projects, what is the ELS project? Oh, ELS is um, uh, back in 2001, right, uh, right after 9-11, uh, you know, I was sort of scratching my head about what to do because I was supposed to do a Steely Dan record for a while and nobody wanted to be in New York and everything sort of canceled and so I started building a room in my house to mix, really dedicated to mix 5-1 mm -hmm. and I ended up doing that and then at some point I realized that how are people going to hear this? You know, there's really no good way. People aren't going to embrace putting, you know, six speakers in their living room or uh -huh. whatever. So I thought, well, you know, any format we'd had prior to this, it was always broken in the car, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the CD, CD became real popular when it was in the car and really not before, because CD players were expensive, but when you were buying it in the car, it didn't seem like you were paying for it, right? you know? And it was the same thing with cassettes and the same thing with, remember how big A-track cartridges were? Mm -hmm. so, um, so I got the idea for that, and uh, I literally went to every OEM company in, in the world, and they all looked at me like, mm, I don't think so. Right. Yeah. And then six months later, I got a call from Panasonic, and they said, yeah, you know, kind of like it, and we have a, a customer that really likes it. And it was Acura, and that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. And so now the system is available in, uh, in all their cars? cars yeah. 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 Yeah, and it gives you a full surround experience right in the car? Yeah, it's, it's changed a little now because, you know, there was the DVDA, SACD war, and neither one won. Right. You know, so the only one that still exists in that format is DTS CDs. So it'll play that, but that's it. Okay. Right. Right. So I, I like to ask when I have artists and engineers of your, your stature here, you've worked with so many different people and uh, both sides of the glass. What is it that makes a great artist? Can we start with you, Ben? Um, I, I'd say most great artists that I know uh, didn't get the memo or something. Right? <laughs> It's really kind of what you don't know. I mean, I think that um, the challenge is being a, a human being that's domesticated enough to, um, to live in, in the civilized world mm -hmm. uh, and uh, somehow can widen that sort of scope of thinking into places that your mind is not supposed to go. It doesn't... It doesn't add up with the time you're supposed to get up in the morning and the way you're supposed to greet people and what you're supposed to do. An artist is generally someone, a professional artist is someone who can do both and still get along in the real world. I mean, I really think that's what it is. The other thing that's really important is, is seeing, seeing in, in the simplest thing what is amazing. And, and there's always something amazing in any, you know, I love photography in any little frame of what you're seeing. There's always something that resonates. And um, again, I think it's not getting the memos, like the, that, that trail of wire is just not special. You know that. And for some reason, someone feels like that it is. And it points it out to others. And we go, wow, I would have never thought that that was right. going to be like that. Mm -hmm. you know? But I think that's the problem is with so many artists that are so great, part of it, they have a hard time getting back into the domestication part of being a human being, which is important too. I mean, it's certainly, you, you can't do it in the street, you know, like you, right. have to, you have to do that somewhere else. <laughs> right, right. Now that's what I think. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, Elliot, what do you think? Well, th that word is, is uh, you know, it's used too often. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there are many artists. I agree. You know, there are bands and there are singers and songwriters. But artists, you know, that's, when I look back over my career, you know, it's, and I've worked with hundreds and hundreds, and I would say, you know, the artists were less than, than 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes you find that, um, that actually the artistry is not something that's even put out in front for people. Like, I don't know, I think about someone like maybe Aretha Franklin, who played the hell out of the piano, who might have more artistic moments than anyone would ever actually see. And, and that artistry is actually not what people capture, they capture the craft. Right. Right. I don't know. It's true. So, so what is the distinction, though, if, if, of all these? Usually an artist has, you know, the artists that I've worked with usually have a vision. Mm -hmm. They have a vision for their music, and they're just a little confused, and usually just 
need somebody's help sorting it out, but they usually have everything in hand. I mean, Ben really has everything together. Mm -hmm. He really does, you know, and, you know, there's an occasional question about stuff and it's really simple because he knows what he wants and knows what he's doing. Right. You know, if you really don't know and you're relying on technology to make you an artist, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, there has to be some something inside before you get into the studio. Right. All right. Great. Guys, thanks so much for coming in. We appreciate you being yeah, here. We're thanks. looking forward to, uh, to spending some time tonight and hearing some music and the concert tomorrow night as well and the, uh, the uh, uh, recording of the concerto and the, the uh, congratulations on the ELS system and so many great things going on. It's just a, a, a real pleasure to have you here. And I'll do this in more organized fashion. Ben, All right, right thanks on. Thanks so much. Elliot, thanks, thanks thank Mitch. you. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.